So there's this whole realm, obviously, of longevity supplements. And, you know, my opinion is that varies from pure snake oil to questionable. Um, but there's nothing that I feel like, you know, there's enough data at this point to say, you know, yeah, people should go out and really, really do this. I think you could put things like NAD boosters, NAD precursors, nicotinamide riboside, nicotinamide mononucleotide towards the, I would put that towards the questionable end of the spectrum in, in the sense that there's conflicting evidence in, in animal models that these things can have some benefits in the context of aging, but there's some positive evidence uh, um, and they're unlikely to hurt you, right? So again, we're thinking about the risk reward calculus. There's probably not a lot of downside to taking NAD precursors, although some people have speculated on cancer risk, um, but there's probably not a lot of harm associated with them. So you might get a little benefit, probably not a lot of harm. I would say it probably depends on where you are on the economic spectrum because you know, money from your bank account could be harmful depending on where you're at. But when you get to the other stuff that's in the supplement realm, you know, there's not a lot out there that I have a lot of confidence in. And, you know, part of this is there's a long track record in this field of really, really bad bets that were made and bad information that got out of the general public. And it takes a really long time to clean that up. Um, and, and so I'm really hesitant to feed into that that aspect of, of the, of this field. Um, so I, I have a hard time with supplements. Um, I feel like we've been burned. Yeah. We often describe excessive supplementation as majoring in minor things. It's easy to, you know, <laughs> get it. The other that. thing I would say, and I don't think most people have, have really thought about this is we have very little understanding of what the combinatorial interactions are going to be. So there are a lot of people who have these stacks of supplements. Um, and, you know, I don't have much data yet, but it's a question that I'm, I'm interested in exploring is what happens if we take, you know, three, four, five, six, seven different interventions that individually, you know, might increase lifespan a little bit or might have a positive impact on health span. We put them all together. What happens? We don't have much data yet, but the little bit of data that we've collected so far, I think the one thing I can say with confidence is it's almost impossible to predict what's going to happen in that I have never seen yet in an experimental setting, a situation where you combine more than three things and actually get additivity or synergy by synergy. I mean, more than additive positive benefits. I've seen several cases now where you get canceling out and even a net negative effect. Now these are all in laboratory animals. So take it for what it's worth. But I do think that the sort of naive assumption that taking, if one thing is good and another thing is good and another thing is good, if we combine them all, we're going to get three times the benefit. Biological systems are immensely complex and predicting the combinatorial interactions, you know, is, is very difficult. And the other thing that I think people don't often appreciate is um, supplements in particular are extremely dirty drugs. So first of all, supplements are drugs. They are molecules that get into your body and have biological effects. Um, they're just not regulated by the FDA the same way, um, but they're extremely dirty. So I talked before about how rapamycin has one biochemical target. It targets mTOR. These supplements that are generally recognized as safe, I, I don't want to say none of them have one target, but I don't know of any that don't at least have a dozen targets or two dozen targets. And so if these molecules are actually getting into cells and affecting, let's just say each are affecting 10 different proteins in the cell. When you combine three of those, now you're affecting at least 30 different proteins. And so it's really, really hard to predict what the outcome is going to be in this complicated biological system. And so my intuition is when you do something to perturb a biological system um, and, you, and you have no a priori sort of prediction of what that whether that's going to be good or bad, 90 8% of the time, it's going to be bad. It's much easier to break a complex biological system than it is to make it function better. And so if you're just randomly messing with stuff, you're much more likely to do something detrimental than you are to do something positive, which I think feeds into my philosophy that we really should focus on the things that we have a high level of confidence are going to, to be beneficial and maybe not mess around with a bunch of stuff that might be good, might do nothing. But then when we combine them all, it actually becomes detrimental. 
Mm, that's a rarely made an important point about supplements being drugs and dirty. What is the threshold or distinguisher between a supplement and a drug, or is there is there one? Yeah, so I I mean I there there might be some like formal like like legal definition that I don't I don't know about. So I'll tell you the way I I think about it. So so I I kind of put supplements and some people like the word nutraceuticals because it sounds maybe a little bit more appealing than than supplements. Um so I kind of put those in the category of things that the FDA does not regulate as a medication because it's generally recognized as safe or grass. So there are a set of molecules that through a variety of, of, of ways can get into this category of being um, generally recognized as safe. And so if a molecule falls into that category, there are much lower restrictions on, on selling that molecule in a nutraceutical format or a supplement format. And the, re the restrictions are lower, although there are still restrictions on what you can claim about those molecules in your product. So, you know, you'll see lots of people claim that that this product with these three generally recognized as safe components is a longevity pill, right? Um, has that ever been shown to increase longevity? Probably not. But the FDA doesn't really crack down on that kind of what I would say is deceptive marketing. They don't really crack down on it, even though technically, you know, that might be against the rules. But but I think the key point is if your components are all on this list of generally recognized as safe molecules you can put that into a supplement format and sell it as a nutraceutical or as a supplement. That's my understanding of the system. Again, this isn't a world that I've ever been in. I've never tried to make or market my own supplement, um, but that's my understanding of, of the, the way that works. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. 